So uh, this should be the last video I'm creating uh, in regards to the MCI triage scenario. So this video is for the uh, single patient that your clinician that can actually transport off of the scene. And we'll say that that has to do both with uh, appropriate triage as well as having to take care of an emergent patient. And it'll count under that same education for the one hour for MCI triage. So what we're looking at is the pediatric patient uh, with a closed head injury. So you guys will need a pediatric mannequin, some uh, IV meds, uh, IV equipment, IO equipment, normal saline tubing. I have an equipment list for you guys to do. And this patient will have gotten struck in the head, uh, not very responsive, had, was unconscious prior to EMS arrival. And on EMS arrival, patient will uh, start vomiting. After patient starts vomiting, and uh, perhaps crews will start looking for a way to stop the vomiting because most of us don't like patients vomiting, a uh, patient will begin seizing. The expectation out of this is not only do the clinicians recognize the need for Versed, which I assume they all will do, but drop the appropriate amount based on patient weight. And I would base the patient weight off of the size of your mannequin. So if the size of the mannequin is about a five-year-old, I would pick a weight for an average five-year-old. And I would have your clinicians actually draw up the appropriate amount of Versed based on what they assume the patient weight is. A uh, patient will not stop seizing, so they will have to uh, attempt second dose. And when they start working on that, patient will start vomiting again. And so now we'll have an airway problem and a seizing issue and your guys and gals should consider RSA or RSI, depending on your service, uh, to control this patient's airway. Now, because of uh, services that would do RSA, we will have the patient stop vomiting and just continue seizing. That way you won't have to worry about, oh, but I, I can't do the uh, eye gel because I have to make sure I can continuously suction the patient. So let's not worry about that. Stop the vomiting, continue the seizing, have them uh, you know, sedate the patient with uh, RSI. And again, I would have them actually do the calculations, actually drop the appropriate amount of meds and push them in the right order. On arrival to the hospital, I do not expect your uh, guys and gals to actually run another arrest. If you would like them to get the practice, feel free to have them do so. But we're going to have the patient go into an arrest when they hit the hospital. And the only reason that that's happening is because I want your clinicians to recognize that uh, head injuries, especially closed head injuries, can lead to uh, ectopic beaks coming out of the heart, which can potentiate a ventricular fibrillation arrest. I'm not saying it's common. I just want you guys to have the option of choosing to run an arrest or not and recognize that using an EKG on a head injury is not a bad idea. I have a lot of notes in here about what meds to use for RSI or RSA. I have notes on uh, ventilatory support, and we talk about uh, the same ventilatory support stuff in the pediatric cardiac arrest station, so you don't have to repeat that information. Keep in mind, entitled below 35 and 45, kids, it's super important to put in a gastric tube, especially if you RSA or uh, RSI the patient because we want to get rid of as much air from the belly as possible, not just to limit vomiting, but because if we get rid of some of that pressure in the belly, we can expand how far the diaphragm can move and we can better ventilations for your patient. Teaching points for your kids, or uh, excuse me, teaching points from the pediatric scenario for your clinicians. So tachycardia is an early sign of shock in a pediatric patient. Don't ever forget that. If the patient is tachycardic, there is already a problem. Pediatric patients can maintain their pressures until they've lost 30 to 40% of their blood volume, and then they tank dramatically. So we have to start preloading fluid in those patients prior to their blood pressure dropping, or else it's very difficult to get it back. So if we recognize tachycardia, and we think that there's some uh, blood loss issue or a patient is in a shock state, fluid needs to be provided into early, and we have to give it, again, by the appropriate weight-based dose. You can look for other signs of shock, and those are all in the notes, right? Poor cap refill, cold extremities, poor peripheral pulses. Next thing I want you guys to remember, we talked about head injuries. And for adult patients, there were three H's that we recognize for head injuries. We can't let our patients go hypovolemic. 
if that blood pressure tanks uh, for adults, it was below 90 uh, for kids. It's age dependent, um, but it increased the likelihood of death by double, especially when compared to patients who did not go hypotensive during um, uh, traumatic injuries. Hypoxia is the next big problem. Patient saturation rates that drop below 90% has a four times uh, increased odds ratio of death compared to patients who always maintain normal uh, oxygen saturation rates. So make sure you're getting early oxygen on these patients. And then hyperventilation occurs in about two thirds of all patients that are manually ventilated. In the head injured patient, hyperventilating can increase the odds ratio of death six times. So be very cautious. Those are the three H's for adults. For kids, we're actually going to have one more H that we're going to add, hypoglycemia. Unlike adults, peds don't have large stores of sugar available. So when the patient is in compensated shock, the patient is burning through their sugar stores. They have to use a lot of energy to maintain that increased heart rate to attempt to maintain vascular resistance, to keep blood pressure at a reasonable rate, and to increase respiratory rate. And when we run out of that sugar in kids, they can't create more. So they become hypoglycemic and everything goes downhill. So we know this patient specifically is seizing, tachycardic, injured, breathing uh, poorly, right? We have to continue checking that sugar and we have to consider calling a med control for um, to, to replace those sugars if we find that it's hypoglycemic. I'd be cautious about just directly giving D25, D50, uh, or D10 to a pediatric patient or any patient with a head injury. I would be cautious. I'd call a doc at a time for an order on that to make sure it's the appropriate thing to do. Um, we have some notes on RSI. Uh, just considerations, such as if you have clinicians that choose to use the uh, sex atomity, remember ETOM is very short lasting. So if they're going to use that, what, if I was going to use atomidate, I would drop Versed while I drop the other RSI meds, because by the time the patient is intubated or eye gelled, everything's secure and I've done all my checks, patient may be starting to wake up and I'd have to resedate them anyway. So I would have that Versed already on hand. And I might do the same with uh, fentanyl to have a weight-based dose of fentanyl ready in case the patient starts showing signs of a uh, tube strain or eye gel strain, however you want to call that. Um, something that came up a lot when I taught this uh, with a different service is people ask between etomidate and ketamine. So I looked up a couple of studies and what we found were while there were only a few studies that showed uh, ketamine didn't show any increase in uh, intracranial pressure for head injured patients, there are actually a couple of cases where uh, intracranial pressure decreased after ketamine usage um, post head injury. So ketamine might be a beneficial drug for this. It lasts a little bit longer than etomidate. It might decrease intracranial pressure. It won't increase intracranial pressure, at least by the studies that have been done. So it's a good consideration when you're deciding between what drug to use for sedation. Ketamine's a good call. Um, and then uh, Cassie, who was one of our um, PALS instructors and is a pediatric ER nurse, actually found a lot of information for um, the treatment of minor patients when there's no guardian available. So you can choose to go through that as well. I found it interesting. I'd left that in the notes that she had looked up because it was good information to have. It is not necessary to meet your education requirements to also go over it. All right. Uh, if you guys have any questions, again, email me, Jen Shea, Matt Milder, or Dr. Burnett. Uh, otherwise, that's all I have for this module. Have a good one.